All right. Good day, everyone, and welcome to We Wednesday. You're in for a great surprise today, a great treat. Uh, thank you for joining us in person and online virtually. Uh, I'm excited to be here today and just to share a little bit of housekeeping with you. Uh, you may have seen behind me or on your screen just a little bit of information about the USPTO We Wednesday, this wonderful program, and also our survey. And so just as a reminder, please send your questions to the we at USPTO.gov mailbox, and we'll be happy to answer them uh, for you online. But let's go ahead and get started. So I'm going to go ahead and introduce uh, our wonderful uh, <laughs> opening uh, senior leader, Elizabeth Doherty, and she is the Eastern Regional Outreach Off Director for the East Coast here at the USPTO. And she carries out the strategic direction of the Undersecretary of Commerce for Intellectual Property and Director of the USPTO, and is responsible for leading our team, the USPTO's Eastern Regional Outreach Office, with stakeholder engagements focusing on the region from Maine to Florida and actively engaging with the community. Ms. Doherty ensures the USPTO's initiatives and programs are tailored to the region's unique ecosystem and industries of stakeholders. And so I'd like to welcome Ms. Doherty to the stage at this time. Thank you. Good afternoon, and thank you, Tamika, for that kind welcome. Uh, you know, having a title like Eastern Regional Outreach Director barely fits on a business card. But what I like to say to people, and I hope is a great takeaway, is that while the title's very long, it all boils down to we help people. And my team and I specifically engage with stakeholders throughout the entirety of the East Coast, 128 million beautiful people doing remarkable things from all walks of life. Uh, and I'm particularly happy to be here on this We Wednesday because I'm in love with this program. I'm in love with the resources that it brings to the community, to the world, and the people that it highlights. So good morning, good afternoon, and welcome to both our in-person and our virtual audience. It's a momentous week we're having, a week in which to celebrate, recognize, and remember. To name just a few reasons to put your party hat on, as if we need any excuse. Uh, on Monday, we began with Earth Day, continuing an over 50-year tradition to promote and engage citizens to care for our planet through community service, enhanced technologies, and awareness. Today, we celebrate Administrative Professionals Day. And come on, how many of them are women? We know this. <laughs> we have lived this life. And while the day has under undergone many name changes, the initial goal to celebrate and recognize all the hard work administrative professionals do has remained. Thank you to all of the administrative professionals that help us to shine. And of course, this Friday, it is truly our day to shine. World IP Day. <laughs> I am hopeful that all of you have taken the week, the month, and not only this Friday, to really get out and celebrate. To celebrate and recognize the creation of the World Intellectual Property Office, but more importantly, the role and importance of intellectual property in changing and shaping our world. So it's very fitting that we're having this conversation today. Women continue to be trailblazers in invention, innovation, and entrepreneurship. Our panel strongly remembers, uh, resembles this remark. To briefly set the stage, I'd like to share that the Women's Entrepreneurship Initiative, or WE, provides a community-focused program that lifts women up and taps their potential to increase equity, job creation, and economic prosperity through their ideas, insights, and innovations. This program builds on the proven success of the USPTO's Women's Entrepreneurship Symposium, which has continued for many, many years. It features advice from those who have made it 
as well as resources to help women protect their IP, fund their ideas, and expand their network of advisors and mentors. We know that while women represent the fastest growing category of entrepreneurs worldwide as of 2020, they are less likely to secure the capital and the intellectual property that they need. They are severely underrepresented as business owners compared to men. According to the U.S. Census, I have some really terrible statistics for you. And their Bureau's analysis of business survey, while men have ownership an ownership stake in about 80% of U.S. businesses, and a majority ownership stake in 63% of U.S. businesses, women hold an ownership stake in only about 37% 37 of U.S. businesses and only have a majority share in 21% of businesses. We're quickly working to change that. So it's my pleasure to be here today to join you in listening, learning, and celebrating women who are truly getting it done. Tamika, back to you. And thank you, Elizabeth. And now what we've all come here for today, um, women transforming industries and recognizing the power of intellectual property. Uh, we will have a wonderful panel led by our moderator, Soma Saha. Soma Saha is a patent attorney for the Office of Policy and International Affairs. She covers a variety of issues involving patents in South Asia, Africa, and parts of North America. She also leads the Patents for Humanity program, an awards competition recognizing innovators who use game-changing technologies to meet global humanitarian challenges. Prior to joining the USPTO, she worked in private practice as a litigation associate in complex patent litigation in the electrical, mechanical, and pharmaceutical arts. And prior to law school, she worked as a process engineer for L'Oreal USA. And so welcome again, Soma, and our esteemed panelists. And Soma, take it away. Thank you. Thank you so much, Tamika. Um, I'm so excited to have all of you here today. We have a very inspiring set of panelists today. Um, but I just wanted to first start by saying um, you, there was an article recently in January 2024 um, from Nature Biotechnology that said that women, that teams that had women um, were developing um, technologies such as, such as artificial intelligence were more economically viable than ones that didn't. And what this tells us is that to build... Um, a, a company or an organization that's really successful, we need women not just to be inclusive, but because that's what makes economic sense. So that's something that I think we need to always remember. It's, it's about inclusivity, you know, creating an inclusive society, but also because it, it's really what makes sense um, economically as well. Um, so today we have three panelists here. I'm going to let them each introduce themselves, um, but I will just briefly tell you each of their names and then I'll let you let them each introduce themselves. So first to my left right here, I have Serene Almaman. Um, she's from Attune IoT. I have Christiana Martins. She's from, she's a founder of Do Goodery and Valor Babitas and Ingrid Vandervelt, and she is from EBW Global. So first, I'm going to hand it over to you, Serene, to give us a few minutes to tell us a little about yourself. Thanks, Oma. Um, nice to meet you all. I'm uh, so happy to be here and grateful for the opportunity to share our experiences. Um, my name is Serena Almoman. Um, I am now the CEO and co-founder of a company called Attune. It's local here to the DC metro area. We're headquartered in Tyson's Corner. Um, but just a little bit about my background. Um, I came to, I'm an immigrant uh, to the US. I was just sharing with my fellow panelists uh, from Saudi Arabia. 
Uh, I came here, I got a scholarship to go to college. I studied computer science. I went to Oklahoma State, which was great because weather-wise was very similar. So I didn't have that uh, cultural shock so much on that side of things, too cold or too hot. Um, and um, after graduation, I moved to the DC area and um, to be closer to some of my family members that are here. Uh, I worked for uh, as a software engineer for government contracting companies, which are a lot here, given uh, where we are, um, and kind of moved my career from being a software developer to project manager to program manager to director. At some point, I had $40 billion in budget, five different projects, you know, kind of trying to digitize a lot of the government processes and forms and things like that. Um, in parallel, I went to my grad school. I went to Johns Hopkins for my business school, so I uh, master's, and then went to George Mason uh, for my PhD, <laughs> so familiar place. Uh, and... Um, uh, and then uh, towards the end of my PhD, I was ready for something else. The idea of a tune ca came up somehow, and I'll, I'll share a little bit more about that later. And then started uh, my business. I'm a first-time uh, CEO. And related to this, I have 22 patents under my belt. Uh, so I could talk to you about a lot of that as well. Nice being here as well. Wonderful. Yeah. Christiana? Well... That's a little hard to follow, but I'm going to give it my best shot. Um, hi, everybody. I'm Christiana Maritans. I'm the founder of Valor Bebidas and Do Goodery. Um, they are sound like two very different things. One is a tequila company, and the other is a social impact uh, consulting agency. Um, my background is in sustainability and corporate responsibility, but kind of how that all started is both of my parents are immigrants. My mom is from El Salvador, and my dad was from Germany. So being born to immigrant parents, two things are kind of normal. One, like entrepreneurship, because you got to... Like back in the 60s when they moved here, they had to figure out how to make a living. And two, sustainability. Like there was no throwing things away. You had to eat your whole plate. Like it's just kind of the life that I grew up in. And I was sort of an a eco nerd when I was a kid. Like I volunteered for the Audubon Society. Speaking of Earth Day, Elizabeth, I actually introduced Earth Day for the first time to my middle school at St. John Fisher. And I, had, I found my speech. It was quite something, let me tell you guys. Uh, <laughs> I was like, wow, my handwriting and my words. Okay, that's seventh grade for you right there. So um, anyway, so I, I somehow, I thought I was going to be a lobbyist here in DC for a cause that I cared about. Came to DC during George, W's first uh, election and I was here for an internship. It's completely separate from that, but I was invited to an inaugural ball and met a group of young women who were here on the East Coast. Um, and, you know, education for me, it's like, it's just important, but where I went to school was not important. And for me, where everybody, anybody that was to school, I'm like, good for you, you went to school. Mm -hmm. But I was talking to these women and they were like, or girls, and they're like, where do you go to school? And I said, San Diego State. And they're like, huh, turned around and walked away. And I was like, oh my God, I don't wanna be here in DC. It's a much different place now, but I, I ended up getting a job at the Walt Disney Company, leading our environmental and STEM education corporate portfolio, uh, and then came to Dis DC, actually, and worked for environmental education nonprofit, which is where I met Maggie, and Maggie, thank you very much so, for thinking of me for this panel, and thank you for the organizers. Um, and when I came to this environmental nonprofit, I realized that I understood how to do corporate partnerships, so I was really good at building brands for companies. We built a program called the UL Innovative Education Award, which is how I met Maggie. Um, and then I realized I was, I, there was a deep need for corporations to have corporate responsibility consulting. So I started Do Goodery in 2019. Um, and we were very lucky. Amazon Studios came to us. Uh, Maggie's old organization, Discovery, came to us. And we launched the business pretty quickly. And then in 2021, my mentor said, you know, Christiana, you've spent your entire life advising companies how to be more responsible. Maybe it's time for you to start your own product company so you can showcase what it looks like to implement responsibility and sustainability into a brand from the very beginning. And I was like, I just started Do Goodery two years ago, but why not go for company number two? And it's a very long story how I landed on tequila, but Valor is my new tequila brand that I'm telling Ingrid about. And we're really focused on bringing prosperity back into the supply chain of tequila. It's a very inequitable industry. The money stays up here and the money stays in Europe, but the money does not go back to the people who actually quite literally will lose limbs over this process of making tequila. So we're really focused on creating a business model where everybody can prosper, 
the people at the beginning of the supply chain can build generational wealth. We can still make money as brand owners, but that it's a model that's replicable for other brands within the industry and then ideally other supply chains. Because as we know, supply chain is really inequitable all over the world. And really do supply chains begin here in the U.S. So that's me in a nutshell, and I'm going to pass it over to Ingrid. I love that. Is, is this on? I think they yeah. go back and forth. Okay. Yeah, I'm like, well, these are all hard acts to follow, right? Um, so I'm Ingrid Vandervelt. I'm the founder and CEO of EBW Worldwide. It stands for Empowering a Billion Women. And we help women and minority leaders across the globe start, grow, and scale their ventures. Um, we connect them with the contracts and capital that are seeking to do business with them. And that enable them with the resources to start, grow, and scale their businesses. Um, but back to, I think, I don't know if Elizabeth, oh, there she is. Okay. But um, back to why this and being here with all of you today outside of the invitation by Paul, thank you very much. I said, anytime Paul calls, I'm gonna be here if I can make it work, so thank you. But, and to what you were saying, Soma, um, the role of women in business across the world, uh, we know that when women are making money, we tend to, and the numbers are even higher with minority leaders, but we tend to drive 12% higher revenue and 35% higher return on investment. And so when people ask me, like, why does this work drive you so much? I frankly look at the world as it exists today and by the way, God bless the guys. I always say if it wasn't for the guys and working alongside together, we're not going to elevate to our fullest potential. But if we're really going to create the global sustainable future that we envision and that we envision for ourselves and for our families and our children and our communities, it requires the activation of women. That's how we create societies that create the impact that we want, but frankly, create the economic impact that we want as well. So just to give you a little bit of background on myself, um, I am a longtime technology entrepreneur. I've built and sold different companies in different industries, but all tech related. Uh, I'm a former business television host with CNBC as well. Um, I mentioned that I'm the founder and CEO of EBW, and as I'm looking at Victor, uh, very proud to say that about a year ago during COVID, we built a distribution company that sold to a company called Shield Manufacturing, which is medical uh, manufacturing. But that company that bought us, the woman who runs that company has 153 patents. So patents are a big part of everything that we do. And I will tell you, if I reflect back to, again, part of why this work is so important for me and for us, when I first started out in technology and building companies, I was told when I went out to raise money for the first time that I wasn't going to get it done. This was told by one of my advisors when I was really struggling to raise the money. And he said, Ingrid, if you want me to be totally honest with you, the reason you're not getting this done is you don't look like, act like, sound like, or talk like any of the tech CEOs that the investors are used to funding, and I just don't see you getting this done. And had it not been for an incredible male mentor who is a huge advocate of a couple of things, see, seeing the future as female, but also intellectual property, he was the one who encouraged me to just stay at my idea, stay at building that technology company, and then get a patent around the technology that I had created, which my first one was real-time personalization software for the web, using neural nets, artificial intelligence back in the day. Um, had it not been for him encouraging me down that journey, I don't know that I would have gotten that done, but it was also in that relationship with him that I recognize just how important it is not only for us as men and women to work together, but to be the one for not only ourselves, but somebody else. When we can say, let me help lift you up to achieve your dream. Let me help you achieve the goals you wanna do. And if you are building a company, by God, protect it with intellectual property because the value increase that it does to your business and just the security around your business is just tremendous. So. For all kinds of reasons, it's great to be here and with my colleagues, and I can't wait to talk with you all today. Thanks for having us. 
Thank you. As you can see, we have a very, very impressive panel today. So today we're going to be talking about women transforming industries, recognizing the power of intellectual property. So that is what we're calling this today. Um, so I'm going to start with a few questions to our panel. And the first one I am going to give to Serene. Um, what inspired you to pursue a career as a change agent to address issues and challenges around green sustainability? Um, yeah, so when um, it, one of the reasons we created the technology that we created is that we saw that there is a need in the industry that we are targeting that there is technology today that can help change it. Um, and for our industry, uh, we focus, so our technology is um, almost like a smartwatch but for buildings, we deploy a, a network of sensors in mostly commercial, industrial, school type buildings uh, to get real time data from things like how is the energy consumption going, what's the water uh, levels are, uh, what's the air quality like, all of these things that matter in maintaining, managing buildings to be uh, sustainable, energy efficient, and healthy. Um, and so when we, when we f first started, um, what we realized very quickly is that uh, there is a big pressure for a lot of our industries, not just kind of the built environment, to move the needle on their ESG initiatives. And ESG uh, stands for environmental, social, and governance. Um, and uh, for the built environment, people, the owner, operators, managers of buildings, um, ESG uh, and uh, reporting on how well they're doing on all those things um, involve doing something in a physical asset, a building. And uh, the big issue is that it's really hard to start to understand what's happening in the building because you need data from a physical asset. And uh, we uh, recognize just from our background, myself and my co-founder, that there is technology today. The sensor technology, this is 10 years ago, was... Um, becoming more available, uh, cost effective and whatnot that could be applied very quickly and easily to start to surface some of these very critical data from a physical environment like a building. So because the technology was available uh, today to solve the issues of today and into the future, uh, we were really excited about leveraging that, putting something together to change the industry, to move the needle on sustainability and healthy buildings and whatnot. The other thing that, you know, the way we kind of approach it as we looked at the industry is that we also quickly realized that things change with buildings. Uh, what you need today, the main issues today could change into the future. We've seen that with COVID. Before COVID, no one talked about clean air and the, clay, uh, the air we breathe or healthy building or sick building syndrome. And so f we had that instinct from the beginning that if we want to create a technology to get data from buildings, let's make sure that we create it to be future proof. So the way uh, we, we did it is that we created this kind of modular, almost Lego pieces that we can kind of mix and match add new Lego pieces so that we could get the right data at the right time from buildings. Um, so that's kind of uh, our, our journey into making change in this industry. Wow, amazing. Thank you so much. Um, so for Christiana, what inspired you, same question, what inspired you to pursue a career to, as a change agent to address challenges in environmental adv advocacy or social advocacy? Um, so it's interesting, like I said, my, my background as a kid was just doing sustainability. Like back then it was just being like an environmental nerd. Like it wasn't sustainability, it wasn't a word, it wasn't anything. And I thought I was going to be a stockbroker. Do not ask me why. Uh, <laughs> my dad watched the Dow, the DGIA was always on. And I was like, that looks interesting. I wanna be on Wall Street. Uh, took my first accounting class and I was like, yeah, no, that's not gonna happen. Um, but my dad in the early nineties, he said, you know, you should think about getting a job in the environment when you get older. And Back then, it truly was not a thing. Like, you would have looked like kind of a, you know, wearing your fisherman's hat, like working for the Audubon Society. I was like, that doesn't look sexy, Pop. I don't want to do it. Um, and then fast forward to uh, my job at Disney, my first real job outside of college, and it was running our environmental education and STEM programs. And that sort of 
it, little did I know that like when I was stuffing Radio Disney bags at my first job <laughs> that I would be owning a tequila company and an impact agency, you know, decade and a half later. And um, so once I sort of understood after Al Gore's Inconvenient Truth came out and, and all of that, um, it was a big rush of greenwashing and it wasn't, you know, there wasn't a lot of impact being had, you know, in terms of like storytelling and marketing and how companies were doing things responsibly. And so once I started working with great universities, great mentors that work in the area of corporate responsibility and sustainability, really understanding what meaningful impact means for young people in particular, my job has historically been working with kids, and then eventually that evolved in working with major corporations. And, and then really understanding how much of a need there is for it, you know, filling a gap for doing this kind of work and consulting, it was, it was really inspiring for me to go, okay, and like knowing how to build teams, how to do this work. So when I launched Do Goodery, you know, it, again, we're so grateful. Like we just had amazing big companies dump a bunch of money in our account. And they're like, go, go build us things. And I was like, this is so exciting. Um, but the thing about consulting, it's not sexy. No one gives a shit, excuse me. They're like, cool, I don't really understand what you do, but like you do good. And I was like, this is not working. And so when I chose tequila, a big part of the reason I chose tequila is it is the sexiest spirit in the world right now. Outside of uh, ready to drink beverages, which are like the um, White Claws and things like that, that is actually the fastest growing alcohol in the world. But the fastest growing spirit by wide margins is tequila. And to get people to care about something, you have to use something interesting. And tequila is interesting for people. Um, and because it's a multi-billion dollar industry where the inequities are so deep, it was a great opportunity for me to come in with my team and do this work that we have background knowledge in and creating sustainable and healthy business models. And then working with great producers down there who know exactly what they're doing. You know, So for us, it was really about bringing our expertise and then working with the expertise of the local Mexican population to do what is now called valor. And it's interesting being a female in tequila, um, if I'm being honest. It's quite powerful, though, I have to say. There's almost 3,000 brands out there. And from what I understand, roughly five of them are 100% owned by women, and I'm one of them. And yeah, it's bananas. It's, it's bananas, but like, oh, thanks, everybody. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, but it's what the best part about all of this is, is that we are working with a team of producers down there that are all in line with the same vision and all want the vision. So the fact that we can bring our expertise together to create this kind of systemic change is what makes us so beautiful. And going back to what Ingrid said earlier about the male allies, it's everything. Like, I, I can't go down there and be like, I am woman, hear me roar, because first of all, that's obnoxious. And second of all, you know, male allyship is everything. You know, people allyship is everything. And so... Um, I think it's a really, it's really cool to try to do this sort of work on a level of drinking tequila. I also like tequila a lot, too. Mm -hmm. It was my first drink in Cabo San Lucas in fourth grade. That is another story for another time. <laughs> um, so, so yeah, so that's, it's, it's all like, that when everybody, anybody asks me about starting their own business, I'm like, you have, it has to feel natural. And all of this has felt so like, you know, when things just doors open after the, and do not get me wrong, there is no sleep. There is not a lot of money right now. It's all startup life, but I love it. And so that's the one thing I always say to people, like, if you want to do something big, you have to love it because as everybody up here knows, it is not for the faint of heart. <laughs> Thank you so much. That was very inspiring. Um, Ingrid, the same question to you. What inspired you to pursue a career as a change agent to address uh, issues and challenges around economic empowerment of women? I think she was born. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Thank you. I'm so glad you're here. It's so great to see so many friends and colleagues here. And thank you for saying that because that actually is the truth. I mean, I'm, I'm a, a, a very faith-driven person. This is not a faith-based conversation, but I will say uh, I have a very deep-seated belief that we are all on planet Earth for a reason, and this is my reason. Um, and having gone through, again, some of the stories that I admitted, or admitted, well, I was admitting, but I admit it all the time, you know, being told the things that I was told when I was building my first companies that I would not be able to get it done, it's just one of those things that, um, you know, it's those gut checks that happen in your life where, you know, I can look at things as they have been historically, and we can focus on, oh, this was wrong and whatever, whatever, or 
take the approach of like, this is just how history was. And this is just the facts of things. And the facts are that women really haven't had these leadership positions. Women don't have these ecosystems like the guys have. And, you know, I believe that every single one of us, regardless of where we are in our careers and in our life, we all have something that we can give back to somebody else. And I think that at this stage in my career, having had a number of successes and having had some brutal failures. I mean, after my third tech company, I was broke and homeless, living out of my car when I couldn't get the money raised for that venture. And it only, you know, it was like 10 years ago when I started admitting that story for the first time. But it's like, I think it's, it's, important to even normalize some of these conversations for anybody, but especially women, when you don't have these historical networks that the guys have had to share these stories of this is what it's really like. Now, I will say, building a tequila company, that sounds pretty freaking awesome. <laughs> I'm like, yeah, okay, maybe I need to jump in on that or start that. That sounds really awesome. Uh, but, you know, we, we, we need that. We need, we need more leaders to be doing this work. We need more women to be doing this work. We need more minorities to be doing this work for other entrepreneurs so that we really can, you know, extend our hand and lift more people up. And at the end of the day, I can sit here and talk about social impact all day long, and I love that. But I'm also a full-blown capitalist. And the more money that women make, I mean, you all have seen the stats. Women reinvest 90% of what they earn into their families, communities, and ultimately the world. So the more money that women are making, the more we're able to really create that change in the economy. So I am literally obsessed about women following what it is that they are called to do and making a heck of a lot of money doing it. And I will tell you, you know, an easy case study on that. When I was um, first inspired to build this venture, which was now back in 2011, you know, the idea of empowering a billion women, and at that time it was by 2020, it sounded like a pretty crazy idea at the time, but it's just what we do now. But at that time, to have a vision at that kind of scale, I knew I needed a global technology partner to be able to have the potential opportunity to reach people around the world. That led me into a conversation with a guy named Steve Felice, who was president of Dell at the time. So you had Michael Dell and then Steve Felice. And I met with Steve Felice, and I painted the picture of the vision of how we could transform the global economy through the empowerment of women. And the very simple idea at that time was imagine if we could get a mobile device into the hands of every woman out there and connect her into a singular platform, a centralized platform, right? This is old school stuff now. I realize that cell phones are everywhere, but not back in 2011. But Steve saw the potential of that vision and saw the potential of basically what was going through his mind was, oh my God, if we team with this woman with that kind of vision, and even if she moves down the pathway of making that happen and screws up the plan, but kind of makes it along the way, and all these women are on Dell devices, that can lead to some pretty big business for Dell. And out of that conversation, we literally handshook on a deal, made up a position called the Entrepreneur in Residence, and I became the first one for Dell overseeing entrepreneurship and innovation globally for the business. But I mention this because people would ask me, so what really was the impact of this idea of marrying up this idea of empowering a billion women with a large global corporation? Well, I was supposed to be there for 90 days. We, it was a test run. We were like, let's just figure out if we even know how to work together, we can make something happen. That ended up going for 36 months, for three years. And in the three years that I was there, we reached over 600 million people, we were tracking to a billion dollars in net new revenue. We launched a hundred million dollar fund that became a $250 million fund. And we did it on a 2.5% OPEX. That was unheard of. Like we experienced massive growth and it cost us very little compared to what they were used to doing. And the reason for that, Michael kept asking, I will always remember and love those moments. I remember being on, Hill and Head Island where my parents have a place and it was one o'clock in the morning and I'm like working away, ch -ch -ch, everybody's asleep and my phone's buzzing and it's Michael Dell. And he's like, how did you do this? How is this happening? What is going on? And I'm like, it's exactly what I told you. And I was like, if you really 
take the time to not just throw marketing campaigns out there to try to appeal to women or minority leaders, but instead like use that money to do exactly what the USPTO is doing, which is how do we actually create the programs that are gonna create the inclusion and engagement and invitation to women and minority leaders to come in and actually engage with us and do business together. Those are the results that you can expect. So my you know, whole reason for doing this again is uh, back to what I said. We all have something that we can give back. I exist on planet Earth to do this work. Ladies, I, I hope that's OK with you, because now that we know each other, like we'll never not know each other. This is just why I'm here. Um, but really, if we're going to create that global sustainable future we envision, it, it, has, it will only happen through the inclusion of women minority leaders. Thank you so much. That that was amazing. Thank you. Um, so as an innovator and respected leader within your industries, how have you been able to leverage your, your intellectual property and still create sustainable growth in your company while also promoting, you know, gender equality and, and some of these other, you know, social equality, environmental, sustainable, sustainability? Are those opposing factors? How do we, how can you do both? Sure. Uh, <laughs> so um, here's the thing about intellectual property, and I think it applies to men and women, is that when you're an innovator, you are the, the least to believe that you're doing something different and new. It's like everyone can do this. You know, it's nothing special. It's fine. It's easy, that type of thing. Uh, but, um, you know, when talking to patent attorneys, they say that they hear that all the time from the people that actually end up getting patents. Um, they they never think that they did anything special. So uh, we had to believe first that, okay, we are creating something innovative that is new that we're going to bring, bring to the industry to change. So um, uh, so we kind of went down, down that uh, a path and we created a technology that you know it's we, we're in the Internet of Things space so that's connecting physical to to the uh, web um, and we created it in a way our, our IP is to like I mentioned before is to create it in a modular way that allows us to mix and match sensors and create the right solution at the right time and that allowed us allowed us to break that bottleneck and uh uh, getting data from buildings and you know that, that we we are targeting and we use this um, uh, a concept called uh, um, in in industrial design concept called modular architecture that allowed Sony uh, to produce 250 different variations of the Walkman uh, in the US industry and we didn't know that when we started that we somehow were gonna think to create our technology in the same way that Sony did, but we did. And uh, because of that, we are now able to uh, redesign and introduce new sensor technology that could be applied uh, within months versus years. And the redesign costs and uh, scaling costs is minimal because of using that particular innovation. And uh, that helped us when we're talking back uh, to COVID, post-COVID, the whole um, interest in healthy building, knowing uh, how clean the air we breathe, we were able to bring that innovation and monitoring indoor air quality and environmental quality to market overnight because of our IP. And what that allowed us is that in the last three years, we grew our business 325%. We became profitable. We're in almost every state. Uh, we're in, uh, we opened up the whole school market because it was not something we even targeted, but that was a big issue in that type of building and environment. And we conquered it. So our IP just really came in handy uh, in making this business something that's um, viable uh, and, and growing. And I, I don't know about the gender kind of piece to it. Um, 
I think in our case, it helped a lot. You know, I'm an uh, owner of a tech company, uh, having IP and saying we have 61 patents, that's the total for our technology, uh, really help us differentiate when we are uh, responding to RFPs and whatnot, that you don't have to say much. Yeah, we are different. We do have 61 patent. It, it does give us a leg up. And so we've been able to kind of leverage that and uh, help my company as a woman-owned and led company to make it. Um, so that's our experience. Yeah. I just have to take a moment and like, you ladies are so, all of you, I'm like, this is so cool. Like, I can't believe I'm up here with you all. And it's just, it's like, these are where these moments and these experiences are so important because like how we get to network and meet and hear and be inspired, like it's everything. So thanks ladies. Thank you very much. Um, so IP is not really a thing for us necessarily because we have tequila. Um, but what is really important is our name and our brand. And, um, I don't have my phone up here with me, but it is probably one of the things that has helped us really stand out besides the investment we're making in social impact. Um, so our, we have a hummingbird. There's a long story behind it. But what's interesting is valor is courage and bravery in English. Valor in Spanish means uh, value, like how you value yourself, the value of something, but it can also mean like your bravery and your courage. And we were really intentional about picking a name that non-Spanish speakers could say, but also had meaning in Spanish. It was really important for us to meet both of those things. And when we decided Valor was going to be the name, um, because we want people who work for the brand, who drink the brand, to feel their own sense of their value. And so it was really intentional in how we did this. Um, there was a, a vodka whiskey company that had uh, Valor Spirits. And in the world of, I know I'm speaking to the choir here, but once you're in a category, just liquor, we couldn't have that. So I did a little research and I saw that these guys hadn't been in business for a long time. So I reached out. I was like, do you want to sell the brand? And they said, yes, we negotiated a deal. And that was that. And just two weeks ago, I get an email from one of them and they're like, I don't understand how you have this brand. We, we own, I'm like, whoa, 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 what's happening? And then my heart sunk into my, I was like, cause I, I always attorney up. I always do things right from the very beginning. And I'm like, how did we, what did we do? Turns out this team did not talk to each other. He sold the brand right out from underneath. him, <laughs> And I was like, oof, that's, that's ouch, you know, but all this to say, one thing that I've learned in doing both of these companies is owning the rights to our name and our brand and our trademark. Holy cow, especially in something like tequila and especially a name like Valor, because the world is like, how did you get this? How did you get this name? And how is there no tequila out there like this? I'm like, I don't know, but I'm not questioning it. So let's keep going. So, <laughs> so I will say just protecting whatever assets you need to protect is so important. And just from, you know, um, it, from the standpoint of like, I'm not a wealthy, you know, individual that can go and use all the resources in the world to lawyer up and all of that. So, you know, having that kind of protection, thank you, USPTO, very much for that. I appreciate it. Um, it's really important. So, yeah, I, I just could not agree more. And I think even tied to what you were just talking about uh, from the the female element. I mean, frankly, there there just aren't that many women who can actually stand up and say, "I've got a patent," right? And it it does. It, it carries weight, um, especially if you're thinking about raising money. I'll give you two specific examples. So on the EBW front, prior to COVID, when we were growing that business, as Javon, president of the business knows, like we uh, grew this international network that you know, grew very, very quickly, over 300,000 people in 88 countries, five continents. And when COVID hit, we were like, oh gosh, all these businesses are going down. We might go down. We were able to pivot that network and actually tap in because the data systems underneath it, we were able to tap into that network and leverage that network to build what became the distribution business. And so we, we sold that business off, that intellectual property that went off to Shield. And then we said, okay, well now that was only 5% of our network. How do we use the other 95% of our network to do the exact same thing so that we can create all this value for, for people who are in the community? So now that whole automated system is in fact patent pending as we speak. And that carries weight when you can say that to the investors, that you've got a patent pending unique system. It just does. I mean, your value can almost double you know, in the conversation for, for what you're trying to raise. So that's on the EBW side. But then on the Shield side, you know, we're working on, it's a $120 million plant down in, in Georgia. And that's a lot of money. That's a big project. 
And I absolutely guarantee you that um, even though Allison, who who is CEO of the business, she was head of innovation for Kimberly Clark and has built you know billions of dollars worth of business for Kimberly Clark, it's still a different deal when you go off and do it yourself, right? And you're looking to raise $120 million. And I absolutely guarantee you that if we weren't showing up to the table, like here is our patent portfolio, right? It would be a lot harder to put all of those resources together. So it's just, it's a business decision. It's certainly a, um, a protection, you know, element to your business. It gives you a piece of paper that you can rely back on to protect yourself. But again, really, if you're aspiring to build something and grow it, the intellectual property that you uh, wrap around your business is just incredibly valuable, not only as you're raising money for the business, but then when it comes time to exit as well. Do you have any, and this is for any of you, do you guys have any best practices for how to um, protect your intellectual property? Are there any systems you have in place or anything? Is there anything you can, any advice you can offer in it as it relates to intellectual property? Can I just add one thing on that? Sure. Because um, we were just talking about this right before uh, this panel started. And, and it's not a piece of advice that I would have thought of. But as we were talking about it, I was like, yeah. And that is, don't overthink it. Mm -hmm. It's actually not as challenging as you think it is. And I was sharing actually with Elizabeth. And Javon, you were there when I was talking about the story. A few weeks ago, South by Southwest was going on in uh, Austin, Texas, and I was hosting five of the female speakers who are also good friends at my house. And Allison was one of them who has all of these patents. And it was one of the coolest things ever. I will never forget this moment. You know, I go downstairs and I've got Jen Welter, who's the first female coach in the NFL. And now Allison is all medical supplies, right? So gloves, gowns, masks, whatever. I mean, all that. And Jen Welter was like, hey, you know, I've always wanted to like create these gloves that just, you know, help you catch a little better. And they, and she has some unique things to it. She's like, I think it'd be really cool to be able to patent that. And I'd love to say I have a patent. And Allison was like, let's do it. And they literally sat on my couch and there was another leader, Kiri Marie Moore, who's from Australia, who's trying to build a business here in the United States. And she's like, it would be really helpful if I had some intellectual property, then I could go put some, you know, she's going to bring money and then bring extra money in. And the three of them sat on my couch and literally Allison's just sitting there and sitting on my desk now is basically the patent information for Jen's stuff and Kiri Marie's is in, in motion. And I was like, that right there, that's what needs to happen. You don't need to overthink it. It is not this intimidating, ridiculously, it does take a while to actually get the approvals, but it's not that challenging of a process if you just allow yourself the opportunity to, to get it started and believe that you can actually get it done. And you can start with the provisional patent, which we did ourselves, we didn't even need at the beginning just to start, and then you can hire patent attorney for the full one. The, the thing, other than overthinking that I could uh, share is to uh, do it as, as soon as possible. <laughs> Um, I know a lot, a lot of us, you know, think about the cost for filing patents and we want to wait until we raise f money and then use the money to pay for lawyers. But um, be creative. We uh, felt that that was important. We started from day one looking, we applied, uh, we filed a uh, provisional patent, but then we were looking for before the year ends to put a uh, file a full patent, went out there, put yourself out there, uh, met a patent attorney that is excited about what we're doing. He said pay in uh, beginning with equity. So we did that. We didn't have to. Do. So, you know, if, if you just kind of go for it and do it as soon as possible, things can happen. You'll find ways and you can be creative in, in making that happen. So that my, that's my, my advice. I got nothing. <laughs> <laughs> What are ways that we, we have a few, I, I, right before, this is our second to last question. So after this, it'll be the last question. Um, what are some ways that women can uplift each other? What are, what are things that we can do to try to help bring each other up, especially in the entrepreneurship space? That I have something about. <laughs> um, I think stuff like this is really important, but societally we have been conditioned to be competitive and to, to be 
I hope she's okay, um, uh, to be competitive. It's just the way, you know, whether it's about men, whether it's about jobs, because jobs are so limited for women historically, the jobs that we're all looking for. And the one thing that I have learned that there is no more power in this world than when we stick together and actually support each other, rather it being being competitive. Because there are 8 billion people in this world, right? There is not one person in this world who's going to be able to do everything. And so we were all to... Miss Ingrid's point here, we were all brought on this planet for something different. You were, I was, you were everybody in this room. So like how much more powerful is it if we can collaborate and bring those different gifts that we were all given? I mean, it's just, it's amazing to me. And I love when women do big things. There is nothing more badass. Like just being up here with you guys, I'm like, God, this is so GD cool, you know, and there, and you know, March is national, uh, international women's month and all of that. And it's really nice to see that we are starting to expand outside of March and it's no longer just about the one month. And I look forward to the day where it's not uh, it's not a question about gender, right? It's just that we all happen to be doing big things, whether no matter who you are. But I don't know if we'll see that in our lifetime. You know, it'd be a miracle if we do. But to me, to support each other and to celebrate one another's successes, because, yeah, sometimes I'm like, oh, God damn it, she's so farther ahead than I am, but good for her, and I can be inspired by that, you know? And I think being able to celebrate each other, because it feels so good to be supported by other women and everybody, right? I, for me, that's that has been my key to success is, you know, my team are majority women, and they are so much better than me at everything they do, which is what they should be, right? And instead of being threatened by that, I'm like... Go. And it lets me go do what I'm good at. So that would be my statement. Um, you know, this may sound very simple and, and not complicated, but encouraging each other is great. And I learned this concept of listening to learn versus listening to win or fake or um, or fix. Uh, we always like if someone comes like I have these issues, you're trying to go into advice mode. What can I do that? But sometimes just to learn how to be in their shoes and just asking them more questions. How do you feel? What, what do you need? That type of stuff helps encourage and uh, keep us going. And the other day, which made me think about, you know, it could be just as simple as saying, you got this, uh, can really bring, because I was talking to my sister and I was like, oh, I have the only, it's like, you, you got this. And it just felt so good. It's like, yeah, that's all I needed to hear. So just simple words of encouragement. You're almost there. Someone told me that the other day. It's like, you're almost there. It's around the corner. And it, I felt so energetic because it feels like there's no light at the end of the tunnel. But these words of encouragement can be so powerful, helpful, energizing, and, and and whatnot, so that's. I love that. I think that we we are not going to have time for questions, but there will be time afterwards. So thank you for that. <laughs> I um, I'll, I'll offer something out for the guys in the room because I was just talking to a group from MIT yesterday, and it was these global leaders uh, that MIT brought together. They're all business owners. And the question came from this guy who runs an HR company. And you and I were talking about this earlier. And he said, can I just ask you a really transparent, authentic question? And I was like, always, please. And he said, um, you know, when we find women candidates who could be CEOs, he said, we're still, he's from South Africa. So um, he said, we're still finding this situation where the other women, back to your point, are kind of taking down that woman and they end up just to sort of keep peace in the family, reverting back to the guy. And I was like, I get that. I mean, I will tell you my biggest challenges in business historically have been women, not the guys. The guys are like, come on, let's go make some money together. And it's been the women. That is changing dramatically. And COVID, I really think, played a huge role in that. Um, and I am so grateful for that because at the end of the day, even with the work we do, I'm like, we could make a bajillion dollars and reach the billions of people and there's still going to be more business out there. Um, and we need all of us to, to be able to achieve these goals together. But my advice back for the guy was I said, thank you for being really upfront about it because it helps us again, normalize the conversation. And I said, but my ask of you is please don't give up. We're learning, you know, um, and minority leaders, it's the same, whether we want to admit it or not, you know, we're, we're learning what the guys in the ecosystems have known for all of history. 
we're learning how to work together, how to be leaders, how to be in charge and somebody's following. And now it's my turn to be in charge and somebody else is following. And we're figuring it out. And sometimes it gets a little bit ugly, but we need your help to like help us get there. And we really appreciate that collaboration. So my advice back, my ask is just, first of all, thank you again. And please don't give up uh, because we, we want to get there with you. We want to work with you. We want to collaborate with you. And, and we're learning in that process. And, and I imagine you're learning from us too. I, I will say one funny thing on that. Steve Felice, who I talked about before, he's actually an investor now in um, EBW. And I always ask my investors, like, you know, okay, at the end of the day, you could fund any deal you want to fund. Like, why'd you choose this one? And oftentimes, and I love this because they're just being transparent and authentic. Steve Felice said, he goes, well, first of all, I know it's a good investment. Second of all, I know you're going to make it happen. But third of all, frankly, it's a whole bunch more fun to sit in a group of all you women and with some of our guys than all my dudes. And he's like, so I'll come in on your deals all the time, you know, anytime you want. And I was like, Thank you for saying that, because we think so too. So that's my my advice and, and recommendation. Recommendation: Don't give up. Please stay in the game with us, and please keep reaching out. We appreciate it. Okay, so now I think we're to our final question. Um, this has been really great. I could have I could speak to you guys for hours. So I, this just has flown by. Can't believe we're at our last question already. But um, what is one piece of advice you would give to women entrepreneurs interested in pursuing a career in your perspective industries? Don't do it. Don't do it. <laughs> I'm just I'm just um, I will. I would, Honestly, whether it's my industry or an industry that you're interested in, I said this before, you have to love it. Like you have to love it. Don't do it because you think it's cool. Don't do it because you think it's what you're supposed to do. Do it because it's interesting to you. Because if not, again, the sleepless nights. I mean, I cannot tell you how many nights I do not sleep. How many nights? And and it's fine. I'm here for it. But if I wasn't, and then I would be like, forget it. So you got to love it. That's always my advice because it, it comes up a lot with young people now. They're like, we want to start my own business, blah, blah, blah. I'm like, okay, cool. But if I hear that they're not interested in doing it, they're doing it because uh, influencer told them or whatever. I'm like, don't do it. Don't do it. Don't do it. Not that I don't want people to take risks, but it's you're going to give up a lot. And um, if you're willing to do that, like you got to do it for something that's deep in here. It's like literally got to be in here, at least from my perspective. And you know, I'll add to that, totally agree, um, that be prepared for the journey because it is not easy. It requires a lot of grit. Uh, but if you love it, then you'll persevere and you'll become a change person. I don't think anyone will want to do anything differently, although it was really hard. <laughs> um, and I want to add another. I know you said one is to lean into your strength. Uh, one of the things that I, I, we hear often is uh, self-development and whatnot. And you think about, oh, let me take all my weaknesses and make them better. But what if we lean on uh, how, you know, our, our uniqueness and what we're good at and bring someone else to work on the weaknesses, you'll become just a version of yourself and it's so impactful. And I think that's something I learned in life. And so lean into your strength and that will help you even persevere even more. Um, so that's my And I'll leave you with uh, one final one. And this is one that I'm sure you've heard many times before, but I will say it again. Then I'll add an element to just kind of how you're thinking about it potentially. And that is like absolutely have a mentor. If, if you do not have a mentor, like job number one, I don't care where I am in the world. When people ask, what is your number one piece of advice? It is find that mentor. And the, the added element to that that I would offer out is, um, and I'm not just talking about any mentor. I'm not talking about like, let's just go find people we can have coffee with and sort of talk about what's going on. I'm not talking about that. I am literally talking about kind of like what I did with Dell when I needed a global tech partner, and I was like, I want Michael Dell. Like, period, stop, that's who I want. And the thing that, what, hap what happens for so many people who have this person in mind that would be like, oh my gosh, this would be like the most ideal mentor in the entire world, we automatically, and women do this a lot, we talk ourselves out of it before we even go for the ask, because we're like, there's no way they will go for this. They will never say yes. But the thing that we don't often realize is that, People who have actually like really made it at scale, 
most of them don't really need money anymore. It is not about that. It is about impact. And the game of growth is just that. It's a game. And they're trying to figure out how can we grow even further? How can we create impact even more? So now imagine that same person being find, finding somebody like you who's coming to the table to offer up to them the idea and the opportunities that you bring, these fresh perspectives, these new ideas, how it can help them build what they're trying to do. In exchange, if they would just spend a little bit of time with you, imagine the difference you could make in their business. That is the secret sauce of securing that ideal mentor. And so my recommendation is, and the advice is, get the mentor, but go after the person you really, really want because you're actually, it's not even an ask. You're providing a gift and an opportunity. So don't take that for granted. You're, you're giving them a huge opportunity to achieve what they want to do. So go for it. Thank you so very much. This was so inspiring. Thank you to the three of you. You all are amazing women and are so inspiring. And thank you so much for sharing your experiences. I know that um, you have inspired a lot of people that are out there. So thank you so much. I'm going to turn it back over to Tamika. Awesome. Awesome. Thank you all again uh, for sharing. sharing your successful entrepreneurial journeys, and how you all have leveraged the intellectual property, uh, <laughs> I'm sorry, in the green space. I just want to share a few things quickly. Um, these are some points that I picked up. Uh, value your creations. Uh, definitely collect again, with a mentor or a collaborator who has the same vision that you all have. Um, also, be prepared for the journey. And uh, definitely, don't overthink it. Get started. Use those free USPTO resources that are available. You've seen them flash on the screen a few times uh, at USPTO.gov. Uh, also, definitely, uh, from day one, I've heard wrap up all of your precious creations, your intellectual property, and those IP protections, right? So thank you again for joining us today. And please remember to take our survey uh, and please submit your questions to we at USPTO.gov. Uh, we've enjoyed having you all here today in person, virtually. And again, a round of applause for our esteemed guests. Thank you. <laughs> Here at George Mason Enterprise Center uh, for hosting the WE program today. And he's here. Would you like to say a word? You're good. But thank you. Thank you so much again. Thank you, everyone. <laughs>